Well, good morning. We're in this series, Good News, because we really all could use some good news. We've had quite a couple of years in our, under our belt, the last few, and we are hungry for good news. And good news that's going to inspire hope, that's going to give unwavering faith. And what we're finding as we're looking at the book of Romans is that Paul's letter to the Romans does inspire that kind of faith, that kind of hope. Because it's the good news of Jesus that's the the power of God for our salvation and our transformation. Now, you might be thinking, salvation, why do I need to be saved? I mean, we're good people. We we try to do more good than bad. Uh, We're smart people. We don't know all the answers, but we like know a lot of things. Many of us are good Christians. We attend church when we can. Some of us even give and serve. Now, none of us have probably said this blatantly out loud, but many of us have probably thought this at one time or another. Life's good. I'm good. What do I need saving from? And that's what today's all about. Because in order to fully grasp the good news of Jesus and how it's truly the best news of all the good news is, we have to first grapple with the bad news of our reality, our current situation. And it wasn't actually until marriage when I really realized the bad news of my situation. You see, though I grew up in a Christian family and attended a Christian college, I was actually even working at a church at the time. When I got married, I was confronted with my sinfulness. Now, I wasn't perfect. I wouldn't have told you I was perfect. But friend to friend, I was pretty proud of who I was and who I was becoming. And then marriage spotlighted my sin. I didn't think that um, I had it all, all together, but I figured I was right like most of the time, like 99.9% of the time. I figured I was right, which meant Amanda was wrong. And what that revealed was I'm not always right. I'm actually prideful. I, I, uh, I thought that I was a pretty kind, patient person. And then I realized that when Amanda wanted to talk to me and I wanted to watch the game, that I'm actually a little more easily frustrated than I would like to admit. I thought I had it all put together, and marriage revealed where I fall short. And it was here where I was, I was very aware that I am not as good as I think I am. It was here when I realized my sin that I was all the more thankful for Jesus. Because when we recognize the bad news, the reality of our situation, what that does is it highlights the need for good news all the more. And there is no news better than the good news of Jesus. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. But today, as much as this series is all about good news, today is in large part about the bad news. So I'm just going to give you that warning up front. We're going to take a deep look at the bad news of our situation so that we can see why we need Jesus all the more. All right, if you got a Bible, I would invite you to turn with me to Romans 1, 18 through 229. It's a bit of a longer passage, but who wants to like soak in bad news week after week, right? So we're just going to kind of take it by the horns. We're just going to tackle this all at once so that in the weeks to come, we can feel warm and fuzzy, all right? Maybe not quite, but hopefully we'll, we'll feel a lot more hope, all right? But we got we to gotta understand our reality, all right? If you want a Bible, you can, of course, follow along in our free church app. That, to get that, um, if you don't have it, Connect Church Community. If you search that in your phone's app store, it's free. We don't get anything from it. We just want it to be a tool for you. So you can follow along, take notes there. Now, today, being about bad news, I just want to warn you on the front end, it's going to be challenging. It's going to be a challenging message, whether you're irreligious or religious, gay, straight, feel like you have it all together, or realize your life's a train wreck. We are all going to be confronted with the bad news of our situation today. But here's the hope. When we can acknowledge our sin, it actually primes the pump to accept our salvation. And that's the good news that Jesus offers. 
So while at times in this message or in life, it feels maybe a little dark, maybe a little depressing, know this, that doesn't have to be the end of the story. The darker the dark, the starker the light is when it breaks through. And what scripture tells us is that Jesus is the light. And with Jesus, there is joy. So with that hope before us, let's, let's pause, let's pray, and let's ask God to say what he wants to say about the bad news of our lives. Lord, we come before you and we ask that you'd give us open hearts and minds, ears to hear what you would have to say to us. Um, would you challenge our thinking? Would you challenge our lives? And ultimately, would you reveal Jesus to us in the life that we can have with him? It's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, you ready? Here's the problem. Starting in Romans 1, 18 through 23, it says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be made known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen and being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. We're starting to see Paul use rather strong language. And he uses this strong language to paint a stark picture. We have a worship problem. God created creation to point people to him. That was his intent. And it's honestly why when I was a youth pastor years ago, I loved bringing students to Buena Vista, Estes Park for our retreats because I didn't have to convince them of a God. The, the magnificence of the mountains screams of a creator. I just got to tell them about that creator. So we, we see this beauty of creation. And the idea that Paul is getting at here, theologians will refer to as general revelation. The idea is that God reveals himself to all people at all times and in all places through things such as creation, morality, and other things. Now, if you ask me, I think God had a cup of coffee when he created Colorado. I mean, just look around from Red Rocks to the sand dunes. You have the mountains in Summit County. Uh, all of it. It's unbelievable. We live in a jaw-dropping state. Now, that actually poses a challenge for us because us, more than maybe some others in other parts of our country, we're tempted to worship creation rather than the creator. But God didn't create creation to, to keep us from him. He created creation to inspire worship of him. And we'll do this in a couple of ways. Maybe it's sacrificing time with God for time on the slopes or at the lake or on the trail. What we do is we, we take a good thing and we start to make it an ultimate thing. Something scripture would call idol idolatry. Now, we aren't just tempted to do this with creation big picture. We're also tempted to do this with created beings. And here's where it gets even more challenging. So it gets more personal. Continue in verse 24. Therefore, God gave them over to, their, to the sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen? Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Okay, we gotta take a time out for a second. Like, was, was this really written 2,000 years ago? Because that situation sounds a whole lot like our culture today. And here's the amazing thing about scripture. While it was penned for an original audience, in this case, the Romans, God 
And his grace still speaks through his word to inform us in how we should interact with our world today. And what the Romans did is they had taken a good thing, sex, which God had created for a context, and they glorified it. They made it something more than God intended. And when sex, sexual experience, sexual expression, when that's the pinnacle, when that's the ultimate thing, people, humanity, we're going to stop at nothing to experience it, normalize it, even glorify it. But we aren't called to worship the created, we're called to worship the creator. And the creator, not the created, gets to set the parameters around sex. He's the one who gave it to us as a gift after all. And the, God's word, and, and throughout his word, it's very consistent in the, the context that he has for sexual expression. It's a covenant relationship between a man and a woman. This is the fireplace for sex, right? When, when it's experienced in this context, it's like sitting by a fireplace on a warm or on a cold winter night. It's good. But when sex is expressed outside of that context, it can rage, it can cause damage and harm and hurt to you and to others. This is why God gave us some parameters around the gift that he gave us. Now, if you disagree with what God is proposing here through his word, I understand, and I would encourage you to talk to God about it. That's what, that's what my encouragement would be, because he can handle your objections, he can handle your questions. He knows your story better than I ever will. And he loves you more than anyone ever could. And he wants his best for you. So talk to him about it. But don't just make it a monologue. Make it a dialogue. Listen to God and what he says through his word. See what he has to say about these matters. Because yes, they're personal and they're also very significant. They're going to make a, a big impact in your life for better or for worse. Now, it could be helpful to talk to someone. A, a, something this context, right, where I'm presenting a, a, some information... This isn't a great context necessarily to talk through the specifics, the nuances of your story. But I would love to grab coffee. I would love to hear your story. I'd love to know what you're going through, a loved one is going through, a friend is going through. And then I would love together to look at God's word and see what it looks like to follow Jesus. Because there is no better life than following Jesus. And God's word maps the way. Now, before I am misunderstood, what I, I want to be clear is I'm not saying that worshiping sex is only an issue if someone is same-sex attracted and expresses it in that context. Paul addresses that here, but Scripture also addresses all of us elsewhere. And we, we can just be as prone as anyone to worship sex. Maybe it's looking at something we shouldn't, saying something we shouldn't, touching someone we shouldn't. Now, rather than, than worshiping this thing, we should worship God for who he is. We should follow him in his way because he's the creator. Creation isn't to keep us from him. It's to actually point us to him. So, whatever your sexual orientation, the, the, the shift from worshiping a created thing to worshiping the creator can be a challenging one. So don't try to go through it alone. Do it with people who love you, people who are going to listen to you, people who are going to walk through life with you and ultimately point you to Jesus. Whether it's sex or something else, we are all going to be confronted with what Paul has to say next. I don't think anyone escapes this. Now in verses 28 through 32. Furthermore, just did they, as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind, so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. 
Okay, anyone perfectly pass that test of like righteousness? Because I sure don't. I mean, just looking at this, this list, I've been greedy, I've been envious, I've gossiped, I've been arrogant and boastful, I've disobeyed my parents. I'm not proud of it, but I've even lacked love for those I should love. Though I've been extended such mercy, I have kept mercy from people around me. Now, according to this, that means I deserve death. That's a bummer. That is not, that is not a situation I want to stay in long. Because Paul's point is this. We are all sinners. We all fall short. We are all unrighteous. Only God is righteous. He is pure. He's holy. There is no sin in him. He can't even be in the presence of sin. I kind of picture it like this. I grew up in New England. And growing up in New England, I was bred to be a Red Sox fan. Die hard Red Sox fan. Grew up in the middle of a heated rivalry. Red Sox, Yankees, one of the probably more well-known sports rivalries. And I would walk out of Fenway Park where the Red Sox play with my dad and he would have to like shield me from what they're selling on the, you know, the street corners because the sayings on the shirts just weren't appropriate about our arch enemies, the Yankees. Okay, when it comes to God's righteousness, it's a really big deal. And I kind of picture it like this. As a Red Sox fan, I can't be in the presence of a Yankees fan. Kind of like God, who is holy, can't be in the presence of sin. I say that tongue in cheek, but the truth is, God is pure. He is holy. He is matchless in his glory. In fact, the angels who are in his presence right now, they are singing, and they will not stop singing this. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Now, being perfect, God can't be in the presence of sin. He can't have any of it. Now, that poses a problem for us because we're sinful, we're unrighteous. Whether it's a, a, just a little white lie or all-out embezzlement. It could be a lustful look or an affair. It doesn't matter. Any sin keeps us from God's presence. This is problematic for us because we're prideful, we're selfish, we're easily frustrated. And because we're unrighteous sinners, we don't get to judge others. We don't get to point our finger at them and say, well, at least I'm not as bad as they are. That's not how it goes down or how it should go down. Because God alone is righteous, which means God alone judges. And he can do that from a, a righteous heart, a, a fair heart, because he's not twisted and distorted by sin. Paul explains it this way now in Romans 2. You, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? In our sinfulness, what we do is we confuse things. We start to act like we're God. We start judging others, but we have no business judging others. And not only is this arrogant and presumptuous, it's very hurtful. Rarely do people walk away from God after experiencing his love, patience, kindness. But often, people walk away from God after experiencing the judgment of his people. And it's got to stop. It's got to stop. God is just, he's going to judge sin. So we don't have to worry about that. He, he, he's going to take care of it. And God is merciful. You see, before he judges, he extends mercy to us. Or, as verse 4 put it, God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. You see, instead of attempting to play God and judging others, we are supposed to repent. We're supposed to actually just turn from our sin, receive his mercy, his forgiveness, and then follow him with our life. It has nothing to do with what others are doing. We don't, we're not pointing fingers at anyone except the one in the mirror. Because that's the one God's forgiven. 
And we gotta, we gotta live that out. We gotta receive that. We gotta live that out. And then we gotta invite others to experience the same so they're not stuck in their sin either. Paul continues in verses five through eight of chapter two. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. Paul's painting the stakes for us. God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who, by persistence in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be anger and wrath wrath and anger, excuse me, there will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first the Jew, then for the Gentile, for God does not show favoritism. We are all unrighteous. We've covered that. We know that we fall short of God's perfect standard. And what we have is a choice to make, like a fork in the road, which direction are we going to go? If we continue on the path that we're on, what Paul tells us is that that's going to end in experiencing God's wrath. We're going to be judged. We're going to be cast aside to where scripture calls hell, whether it's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Trust me, you don't want to go there. Or if we repent of our sin and we choose to, to follow Jesus, what we just read is that there's a much better future in store for us what scripture calls heaven, where we get to have a relationship with God, where there's no more mourning or crying or death or suffering, all of that will be long gone. And we get to experience life with God forever. We have a choice to make. Are we gonna choose a path that ultimately leads to destruction or are we gonna choose a path that leads to life? Jesus being the one who makes it all possible because you see, while God's word maps the way, God's Son, Jesus, is the way. He is the way that we can experience this full life, this eternal life with God. So what path are you going to choose? Paul uh, went on to prove that, that we're all accountable for our sin. We might not have called it sin because we didn't have that terminology, but we've all been there. We've all done that, the thing that we shouldn't have done, the thing we shouldn't have said. He, he puts it this way in Romans 2, 12 through 16. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by the nature things the law are required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, witness in their thoughts, sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. What we need to understand is that God had given his law, as Paul refers to here, to his people, the Israelites. And it was to teach them what it looked like to live in right relationship with God and with others. But the Jews, many of them, they latched onto the law and not the law giver. And what they did is they, they put all their apples in that basket. Like, hey, it's based on my performance. And that's fine if you can perform perfectly, but no one can. And, and what Paul is saying is, look, even if you don't know those things, all the, the rules, all of if you don't know all of it, that's okay, because God's still giving you a conscience. And we've all been in that situation when we, we knew the right thing to do, but we chose to do the opposite. Or we should have said something, but we chose not to. And even just one of those experiences keeps us from God. We've sinned. We fall short. Now, this has all been about unrighteousness. All right, so if you aren't feeling unrighteous, you can reread the passage. But I think many of us are feeling the weight of that. But there is a, there is a few of us that might be thinking, you know what, like, I, I feel pretty good about how I stand. Paul addresses us next 
when he talks about self-righteousness. You see, he addresses unrighteousness with the irreligious, but then he addresses the self-righteousness of the religious. Puts it this way as we wrap up. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you're instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have the law, uh, have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then, who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it's written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Then he talks about this, this sign of uh, the, a relationship with God in the Old Testament, the Israelites. Okay, he talks about circumcision. We're going to talk about this more in weeks to come, but just want to preface it with that. He says, circumcision has value if you observe the law. But if you break the law, you've become as though you've not been circumcised. So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet, obey, yet obeys the law will condemn you who, even though you have the written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. The point being, look, you can have all the right information, but if you don't do anything with it, you still fall short. Even if you teach others all the right information, and, and you yourself aren't practicing it, it's not good enough. Because you too, I too, fall short. And then he, he wraps up with this. He says in verse 28, a, a person is not a Jew who is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly. Circumcision is circumcision of the heart. By the Spirit, not by written code, such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. The encouragement to us would be, let's not try to be like uh, the Jews that Paul describes in this passage, who pride themselves on their, their knowledge of things, and even maybe apply a lot of it. But we miss, we miss the mark in one way, and then and we you know, hold it over others. We don't hold it over ourselves. Honestly, when I read this passage, this is challenging for me because like, if I look at my life, it would be basically kind of like what Paul was describing. Like I, he's basically writing it to me except 2000 years ago. I grew up in a Christian household. I've done the good Christian things. I, I went to a Christian college. I have degrees to like prove it. I, I work in a church. So I like, my job is to teach you to teach people the things of God. And, you know, on my best day, I do that from a pure heart. I, I follow Jesus. I help others follow Jesus. But as Paul points out, there, there are days where my heart's not pure. I, I'll preach or I'll do something to gain the applause of others rather than for like an audience of one. Or maybe it's wanting to, to win people over. So I, I gather people for my thing instead of sending them to go do God's thing. Whatever it is, my heart can be impure at times. My, my, my motives are off. And Paul is saying, look, yeah, cool, you do good things, but what Jesus really wants, what God really wants, he wants your heart. He wants a repentant heart because God's not impressed by our religious actions. He desires our righteous hearts. And no one's righteous, not even one. Whether you're, you're blatantly unrighteous or you're subtly self-righteous, we all fall short. And that's why repentance is the antidote we're searching for. Repentance is the antidote to our misplaced worship Be, as it replaces God in his rightful place. Re repentance is what we are in need of because Jesus is who we need. Repentance is our response to Jesus because left to our own devices, we fall short. Could be blatantly, could be subtly, doesn't matter. Unrighteous, self-righteous, None of us are righteous. We're all sinners, which means we need a savior. We need one who is righteous, one who could stand in our place. 
and make us righteous before God. Friends, we need Jesus. And that's where we're going to pick it up next time. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for telling us very plainly, very clearly, that we aren't as good as we think we are, that we do need saving. We need you to show up because left to our own devices, um, the path isn't leading where we want it to lead or, or you want it to lead. So would you move in our hearts by your spirit? Would you spur us to repent? to turn from our sin, our unrighteousness, our self-righteousness, and instead would we receive your forgiveness, your mercy, and we go your way, as hard as it might be at times. Would you help us? Would you strengthen us by your Spirit to go your way? It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for watching. We hope that the message encouraged your faith. If it did, be sure to subscribe and share it with a friend to encourage them too. My name's Chris. I have the privilege of serving as the lead pastor here at Connect Church, where we believe that life with Jesus and life with others is best. That's why we exist as a church to connect the disconnected to a growing relationship with God. And we do that in a couple of ways. First is help you connect with Jesus through our weekly services. Second, connect with people through joining a community group where you can make some friends and grow in your faith. And third, connect people with Jesus by serving and sharing your story with others. I hope to see you at a worship service soon. And in the meantime, be sure to download our free church app by searching Connect Church Community in your phone's app store. The app is the best way to stay up on everything that's going on around Connect. Let us know how we can help you get connected by filling out a Connect card, find a group, and even give to help see this mission and ministry advance so that more lives can be touched with the good news of Jesus. You can connect with God, community, and your purpose, and we're here to help. See you soon.